Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the September meeting of the Memphis Horticultural Society. Uh, I'm very happy that we can still have these meetings via Zoom when, because of the fact that uh, we're not able to meet in person, or we can, but people don't feel comfortable doing it. But uh, I'm really ex very excited tonight because we have a very different change of pace for the Hort Society. Our speaker is Dr. Michael Collins, Associate Professor of Biology at Rhodes University here in Memphis. Michael grew up in the arid deserts of Arizona, but he's lived here in our humid Southeast US for 25 years, so I guess he's used to it by now. His major research interests are in the ecology and conservation of birds. He's conducted research in avian malaria, the connection between climate change and reduced avian body sizes, and the ecological drivers of tick populations and tick-borne diseases, amongst many other interesting avenues. In the past few years, he has traveled to Namibia, South Africa, Alaska, and the Tetons of Wyoming to explore natural habitats and landscapes, and I'm very jealous to say he recently returned from a trip to Ecuador and Peru, where he visited the Amazon and the Galapagos Islands. In his spare time, I don't know where that comes from because he also has a job at Rhodes University. He likes to spend time with his wife and teenage son, walk his dog, kayak, and of course, bird watch. So Michael, I'll turn it over to you. All right, Steve, thank you so much for the, the kind introduction. I'm um, trying to share my screen right now. So I hope everybody can go ahead and see the, the first slide of, of the PowerPoint. And, uh, and so today I want to uh, first thank, thank you guys for the opportunity to, to share some of the knowledge I have of, of the, the plants and animals of, of Namibia. And, uh, and today, what whoop, it's going here. Um, we'll start by looking at some of the geology and geography. You know, guys know as well as anybody how important these things are to uh, the, the types of biomes that exist there and then the plants and animals that survive in those, those places. Uh, and then I'll go through and look at some of the, the specific plants and birds and mammals that we saw and uh, learned about. Uh, and then I'll give just a little side thing into a, a couple of days that I spent in Cape Town, including a few visits to uh, Kirsten Bosch Botanic Garden, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so as Steve said, I'm a, a professor in the biology department and the environmental studies and sciences program at Rhodes. Um, I've been in the South for a long time. So most of the time I, I, I spend my time with, uh, with students going out to places like our beautiful Wolf River in our own backyard, um, teaching them a little bit about birds, trying to help them fish out when they inevitably uh, dump in their, uh, dump their canoe into, a, into the Wolf River. Um, but in 2019, I had the opportunity to um, take an environmental sciences class to Namibia. Um, it was my first time to travel to anywhere uh, in Africa. Um, and, I, and I want to preface this discussion this evening with that I am not an expert in Africa or in Southern Africa or, or in some of these things. Uh, Africa is a massive place. It's triple the size uh, of the United States and has 54 countries. So it's really different. I've never been to the Sahara or the Sahel, the Western coast, um, uh, never been to the, the Congo, this amazing, this amazing place. Um, East Africa, the Horn of Africa, including the, the East Africa Rift. Um, and the only two places where I was, was down here in Southern Africa, in Namibia for, for three weeks and in Cape Town in the, the Western part of South Africa for a little bit. So um, I'm passionate about this. I have a, a long interest and a career in, in wildlife and conservation and uh, really done a lot of work with birds. Um, but this really got me outside of my comfort zone. And, and so if you uh, hear anything that you're like, I don't know about that, feel free to speak up, drop Steve any questions that you might have in the chat. And I'll try to remember to take some pauses here to, to field any questions that you might have. Uh, so in 2019, we um, took a class with uh, nine students down to uh, Namibia. Uh, we uh, first started learning about some of some Namibia uh, with the Namib Desert right here. It's right along the coast. It's absolutely phenomenal. This one of the driest places on earth after the Atacama and the Kalahari deserts. Um, it's just absolutely striking. It goes right up to the, the ocean. And so on the uh, eastern side of Namibia, you're bordered by the Kalahari to the southeastern part of the country. Um, and then just east of the Namib Desert, you have what's known as the Great Escarpment. And the Great Escarpment is this pretty huge range um, that comes all the way up here into the southern part of Angola and forms this almost like a big U like this, all the way around the southern part of, of the continent. 
Um, and, and so this gives huge plateaus and valleys. Um, it's associated with a lot more rainfall and greenery. So that's pretty, pretty interesting. And then uh, along with that escarpment, you have this large central plateau. And we'll see pictures of, of some of these things. And so this vertical relief combined with different um, air patterns and rainfall patterns and oceanic currents really creates a, a good variety of, of habitats. And in those habitats, you see, of course, different suites of plants and animals. And it's just a really rich environment to go and see some of these things. Um, coming down from Antarctica, you have the Algoulas Current, uh, which brings really cold water even into the uh, African tropics um, from the uh, Southern Pole. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, on the Indian Ocean, you have the Benguela Current that brings mm -hmm. warm water coming in. So these would, would uh, have you know, parallels, for example, with these cold waters coming down in the, the uh, western part of the United States coming down from Alaska, whereas you have those warm currents coming up. Um, on the, the eastern coast. And so these two um, big currents all meet right down here in the southern part of Africa and create this really complex pattern. And this is beyond the, the scope of this talk, but one of the things uh, in trying to address climate change and make predictions for Africa, one of the, the difficulties that you don't encounter, and there's a number of difficulties with this research, but one added difficulty here is the mixing of these currents with warm water being much more likely to evaporate compared to the Algoulas current um, really makes some added uh, uncertainties in here. Um, and so uh, one other thing I'd just like to point out, I did not get to here, but uh, Kruger National Park is, is over here on more of the eastern side of, of Southern Africa. Um, and then I won't get into this a, a tremendous amount either, hardly at all, but uh, Namibia is a, is a relatively new country, um, formed as its independent country only in 1990, so it's a very young place, um, but they have been pioneers really in looking at ways to advance conservation goals of endangered species, of wildlife, and especially in areas that are uh, stricken with uh, less developed uh, economies and increased fre uh, frequency of, of poverty. And one of the ways that they've done this quite successfully is through the development of about 80 different conservancies where you have local control of the land and the management of that land and basically what this does is it really decreases the acceptance and the uh, incentive to poach wild animals because these animals are much more valuable for ecotourism or big game hunting than they are for their bush meat. And historically, when you would just have a protected area, here's a park right here. You can't hunt in here anymore. These animals are all protected. People didn't value that wildlife because that's what they used to use to get food and supplement their diet. And well, now it's worthless to us. So why would we care about protecting it? Why would I care if my, my neighbor poaches some animals? It was worthless to me anyways. But now through the development of these locally run conservancies, that wildlife now has value to that entire community. It provides roads and hospitals and schools, as well as just straight economic payment to guides and to households in that community. So now there's an incentive for the community to work cooperatively to protect their wildlife. So this can be a, a, a not the only way, but a, one of the ways, especially in poverty stricken areas to really advance both human economic development along with protecting our wildlife. All right, so I was in, whoop, I was in Namibia for just three weeks and it goes like that. It's really amazing. Um, and so this is what kind of our itinerary looked like just to kind of uh, give you a whirlwind tour. We started right here in, in Windhoek, the capital. Namibia is a, is a former German uh, colony. So uh, German is spoken there, Afrikaans is spoken there. English is the primary language though. Um, and then there are dozens of local indigenous language and different dialects of these things. Some of the click languages from the San people are spoken in some of these places, especially towards the Eastern part. Um, but it has a really rich history, an amazing history. Um, and I was again, just able to, to scratch the surface of this, but we started in Windhoek, the capital. Um, and then we basically did this clockwise trip around more or less kind of the Northern half, if you will, of, of Namibia. And we went to a bunch of different uh, locations and a, uh, about half a dozen major different biomes. And each of these biomes has a, a, a particular type of, uh, a lot of overlap, of course, with some species that are fairly ubiquitous and generalist. But then you have some local endemics in these areas too that are, that are really special. And we'll look through, through some of these things. 
Um, and so the first habitat that we visited is that Namib Desert, right there along the coast. This uh, coast is sometimes called the Skeleton Coast, and it is absolutely amazing. Uh, you look out at some of these, these things, and uh, these are pictures that my students and I took. Up in the top right is, is um, one of my students and the rest of us. I think I'm that one back there, back here in the hat. This, this young woman is on the cross country team. So she motored up this sand dune called Big Daddy. It's a thousand foot sand dune. And just like walking in the dry part of the beach, going up a small little sand dune, you step up a foot and your, your, your foot slides down nine inches. And so this was like a really brutal cardio workout. And Mariella is here leading the, the, the group up to the, up to the top of this dune. It took us about an hour and a half to get up there. And we ran down, sometimes literally head over heels in about eight minutes. So it's really, really a, a fascinating place. And you see some of these, these landscapes like up in here and you just wonder, you know, how can a tree survive in this place? This tree might be 50, 100, 200 years old. How can something survive under such harsh physical conditions? And then you'll look somewhere else and there'll be an oryx walking by. And it's how can these animals survive under these extremely brutal, harsh conditions? Now, from there, we, we uh, visited some succulent Karoo. This is uh, just absolutely beautiful habitat. Um, it wasn't this green when, when we got here. This is one of the pictures that I, I, I only have a camera phone. So most of the pictures in here are mine. Some are from my students, but this is one that I, that I got from somewhere else. Um, but the Cyclone Crew just has these, these amazing diversity of, I, I thought it had the, the richest plant community of, of, the, uh, of all the biomes we visited. Uh, and then we went to uh, the gravel plains, which look like a moon landscape. Again, you know, it just seems harsh. It looks like not too many things could live here. Um, but I picked this one out in particular because this is a, a sort of typical in some ways of Africa that you look out and you see a few plants, you don't see a whole lot, but you look more carefully, there's a giraffe right here. Right, and so some of these things are uh, just almost hidden in plain sight. Um, then we went up to some mountain desert. So this is getting now up onto that um, great escarpment and starting to get close into some of that um, central plateau. Um, and here we just had some uh, amazing places, including some palm trees and some other things. Elephants came right into our, our camp and uh, we, we had camps like this where we stay in these, uh, these tents most of the time. And, and our guide was in one of these tents and the, the elephant was literally eating branches right above his tent, ripping these branches off and you could hear it chewing and chewing. It was just absolutely phenomenal. And we'll talk more about the elephants here in a little while. Um, so then as you move a little bit further to the east from this great escarpment, now you get into the central plateau and uh, you can see some of these plateaus uh, you know, in these different places here. This is what they look like a little bit up close. And then from one plateau, you'll sometimes look out and see other plateaus that have been basically separated through, through erosion. Um, and then up close, uh, they're extremely rugged, such that you get some isolation of some populations. So for example, uh, populations of Cape Buffalo live up on the tops of some of these plateaus. And it's quite difficult apparently for some of these Buffalo to get up there in the first place. And once they're up there, they pretty much stay up there. So these populations start to get uh, isolated pretty quickly. Um, and then my favorite biome, uh, I think of all of them, uh, in, in some sense was the, the most bizarre. And this is um, these pan environments. In particular, uh, we went up to a, a, a national park called Atasha National Park. It's in north central part of Namibia. Uh, and, and it's this massive, looks like a giant salt flat, basically, is, is what it looks like. And so this is what it looks like. And you again, you just wonder, how does anything survive here? But this system is seasonal, seasonally flooded, right? Uh, and, and so it, it formed um, a long time ago as just a windblown depression. And then 100,000 years ago, during the last glaciation in this part of the world, that glacier dug it out even a little bit further. And historically, it was a freshwater site that drained to the um, ocean, but the river systems changed. And so now as that uh, water flows into the Atasha pan, it sits there, it has no out current and it slowly dries. And so it becomes a salty thing. But every year this place floods up to, you know, one to two, maybe even more meters in depth. And in this environment, believe it or not, there will be catfish estivating. And so these catfish dig down into the mud they basically fold their bodies in half, they curl up on themselves and secrete this mucus 
and they will just hunker down until the conditions are wet enough again for them to wiggle out of their mud, swim around, and reproduce before they go back to uh, estivating. So it's this really remarkable uh, geological phenomenon, and then the biology, the adaptations that have arisen that allow life to survive in here if only seasonally was, is just absolutely mind-blowing. All right, um, so given the, the horticultural nature of, of this group, I wanted to to really uh, start off, uh, so some of you who might have to leave early can say, well, at least you talked about plants, didn't talk about birds and mammals the whole time. Um, so what I'd like to do is just go through some of the, some of what I thought were some of the cooler plants. Uh, we saw some that were widespread across good parts of Africa. Uh, we saw some that were local endemics. We saw some that have some amazing adaptations. We uh, talked about some that have certain, um, uh, uses that, that the indigenous local peoples use to, they will use this as a toothpaste or, you know, different things like this. Um, and so anyhow, we'll go through not exactly a random uh, list of plants, but some of the ones that I thought were pretty cool that I, that I thought I would share with you guys. Um, and as we make this kind of transition, Steve, are there any questions in the chat yet or no? Um, so far, nothing. Okay, well, if anybody gets any questions, please feel free to uh, send those in the chat and, and tell Steve to ask promptly. I, I do not mind being interrupted at all. It gives me a, a little bit of a chance to go in a different direction on a tangent, which I, which I really enjoy. All right, so the uh, first things that, uh, that we're looking at are, are two trees from the genus Boschia. Um, one is called shepherd's tree. The other is called stink bush. And um, you might notice that both of these have really white bark. Um, shepherd's tree is uh, uh, useful for uh, actually people uh, like to sit in it just for the shade. But I thought what the neat thing about this tree is, is that it, its roots go down over 200 feet, right? It has a tap root that goes down over 200 feet. I, I don't know what you guys might have an idea about what the, the deepest tap root is, but this is the deepest that I know of. So I found that absolutely fascinating. And uh, growing up in Arizona, I took a geology class and had a professor who had a uh, corpse flower growing in his, his backyard. And so I, I saw this stink bush and I was like, what's the story with that? And like corpse flower, this thing is fly pollinated. And so it's uh, flowers are just awful smelling, attracts flies for that, that pollination. And so these two, two trees, stink bush and shepherd's tree, both in the same genus uh, were I thought pretty, pretty interesting. One of my favorite trees that we saw here uh, is, is called quiver tree, sometimes called giant aloe. And this just looks like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. Um, this is a succulent. So the, the large branches are, are more or less uh, fleshy and, and hollow. Um, so these are used to as, as uh, containers to transport water and as the name implies to, to transport things as, like quiver. Um, and, and so anyhow, uh, these, these trees again are li living in these harsh environments can live for 200 to 300 years and on top of being used for storage, they're, they're one of the more commonly used um, uh, fuel woods uh, for, for Southern Africa. All right, so I think probably everybody here is, is, has probably at some time uh, heard about Willichia. This is, is an amazing plant. This sad looking, beautiful specimen up here might be a thousand, two thousand years old, right? And, and again, these things live in the gravel plains down here where it just, you wouldn't think things would be able to live even for you know, a single season to basically germinate, uh, flower, seed, and die. But here you have something like Wawichia that can live for thousands of years, certainly multiple, multiple, multiple centuries. Um, it's a dioecious plant, which I always think is really cool to share with my students because you know, students, one, don't know much about plants and getting them to understand that, hey, some, some uh, plants have sex and they have this thing called alternation of generations. And, uh, just kind of turning them on that everything isn't about uh, humans and vertebrates. Um, but this Wawichia plant has only two leaves. Uh, and so you can see here, uh, here's one leaf right here and it starts to get this woody uh, growth down here at the base of the leaf. Here's the other leaf. Um, the female plants tend to be slightly larger than the males, um, but in general, their, their leaves can grow up to about four meters. So about 12, 12 or 13 feet. Um, and the uh, females produce these, um, cone-like structures uh, during, during reproduction. But the, the well witchy is just, again, an absolutely phenomenal type of thing. Um, these uh, pictures here don't have it, but a lot of the 
the Wawichia plants will have these little um, rock walls, if you will, where you're not supposed to walk in here. So you can see here that people are walking around close to this plant and for something that's so long lived, um, you don't want people um, destroying, uh, eroding away the, the population for something that has such a long lifespan. All right, again, something out of a, a Dr. Seuss type of book. This is um, a, a succulent called thick foot. So pachypodium, pachy means thick, like a pachyderm means thick skin. Pachypodium means thick foot. So you, you see this thick foot uh, here. And if you've ever seen the, the bujum trees of, of Western Mexico, of the, of the Baja Peninsula, um, it reminds me a little bit of those. I, I would be surprised if they were at all closely related, but just the, 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 the look of these things, they're just so different from anything that, that, that I've seen here in, in North America, uh, just really stuck with me. Um, and then you start to get some, some other things like rock splitting fig, African rock splitting fig. Um, by the way, the, the, the trip that I, I did down to uh, Peru and Ecuador recently really reminded me how much, how cool a strangler fig is. Um, they, they, they call them um, palamatos, a tr stick or tree killers in, in Spanish down there. And, and uh, they're just an absolutely fascinating group. But this here is the rock splitting fig. And we are up in those mountainous areas uh, and growing out of these cliffs, this bare rock would be this massive fig tree just growing out. And, and so you can see how they, they get their name rock splitting fig and they just grow their roots down into those rocks and their uh, fruits that they produce, their figs are really popular with the um, African um, green parrots. Uh, and, and so this was one of these, these neat things that, uh, again, you have a, a species that's just capable of surviving in these really demanding conditions. All right, um, moving over a little bit um, more, uh, this is now a little bit east uh, of, of Atasha, uh, you had a, a tree called Milpani. Um, this is a, a tree that is almost evergreen. And the reason that that's important is as you enter the dry season. So this part of Africa has a very pronounced dry season and wet season. Um, and, and so as you start to get into that dry season, a lot of the plants just drop their leaves. Um, but Mopani is one that stays almost evergreen, even well into the pretty long, prolonged droughts. Um, Namibia right now is in its worst drought in over a century. When I was there in 2019, they thought it was the worst drought um, in 95 years. It's continued. Um, on through 2020 and through 2021. And um, maybe some of you guys saw this, but Namibia recently sold off some of their elephants. Um, so the elephant population in Namibia is, is doing quite well. It's rebounded, the population numbers are high, but they recently auctioned off some elephants that were some combination of um, perpetrators, let's say, of human wildlife conflict. So they were uh, raiding gardens and, and crops and things like this. Um, and so in the recent past, the Namibian government ha had to pay out due to elephant damage to different property, somewhere on the ballpark of, I, I, I think, uh, half a million dollars. Anyhow, they auctioned off about 60 elephants recently, mostly to Chinese zoos. Um, and, and so that created a bit of a controversy in the, in the conservation world about you know, uh, the, the value of auctioning off animals. Uh, and things like this, especially um, uh, something like, like an elephant. Uh, but, but anyhow, getting back to this, these Mopani trees are really useful forage for these um, mammals and, 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 and even in a few cases, perhaps birds, um, especially during those, those drought conditions. Um, this is the, the dominant tree around the Atasha National Park. And it has this really hard black wood that they use um, not only for building, but where I saw it used mostly was for um, artis artisan type of, of stuff. And so you'd have this black wood that looked uh, to me to be like ironwood. And it was a, a really heavy, very uh, durable, hard wood. Um, and then their leaves um, have these uh, structures that almost make them look like the Samaras from a, um, from a, a, a maple. They kind of come together like this and kind of do this little shape like this and make them not exactly, I know, but a, a little bit like a like a maple seed. All right, um, can't can't go to this part of the world and, and, and not talk about the euphorbs. Uh, these things are absolutely amazing. You you look at these as uh, uh, 
I don't want to say a completely untrained eye, but as somebody that is, is maybe not as knowledgeable about plants as I should be, I look at these and I say, looks like a cactus. Not closely related at all, completely different. Um, and then again, within the euphorb, you have a tremendous amount of, of variation in, in the shapes and forms and morphologies of these, of these different species. And they are just absolutely amazing. One of the things that that I, that I found so often just to be amazing is it's not just the ability of these plants to survive under these conditions, but that indigenous peoples found ways that these things were useful, that this plant is useful for this and this one is useful for something else. And just thinking um, before everybody joins, Steve and I were talking about kind of cultural transmission of knowledge and, and how many things are kind of being lost during the, in these younger generations, things like canning and knitting and and gardening and stuff like this. Um, and, but all this knowledge has been, you know, recorded and, and culturally transmitted. And so these euphorbs produce a milky sap and, and uh, local populations will use these in some cases where there are fish populations that can be, be uh, harvested to poison those fish and then go scoop them up to, um, to eat them or dry them or, or what have you as, as a source of, of protein. So again, just something really fascinating with, with some of these plants and their ability to survive. The, the acacias, eh, man, I'm gonna go through, you know, how many favorite movies do you have? Top five favorite movies and you can list off 20, right? It, it's the same for the, the, the flora and the fauna. Um, these, these acacia trees were absolutely um, touched me in a way. I grew up in Arizona and where we have um, a, two, species of, two species of acacia and, and then to go, you know, halfway around the world to Southern Africa and to see different species, a handful of species that I, that I came across that are in the same genus was just absolutely, uh, it, it really does make the world seem like a, a small place. Um, and so to go out and see some of these things and, and even just in a period of, of three weeks, I would go out there and, and, and look at, at these camel thorns, for example. And you have um, some birds that will, um, have particular nesting habitats. And, and there was one species of bird called a white-browed sparrow weaver that loves to nest in these acacias. And so you could look out at a distance and see all these nests, like a big colony of, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 nests all in a single tree. And it was gonna be one of these acacias. And there'd be all these other trees around, they were not being used. And then on top of that, they position their nests in certain parts of this tree to basically um, maintain uh, as efficiently as possible relatively cool temperatures during the breeding season. And so they put it in a position, not only such that the afternoon sun is not shining on the nest, but so that during evening winds, those winds are coming through and, and cooling off those nests in the, in, the, in the afternoon and into the early evening. So I thought it was really neat, again, how you had this, uh, these harsh conditions and how uh, natural selection has resulted in these adaptations of plants being able to survive and, and uh, animals being able to, to use these as, as nesting substrate and sources of fuel and food. Um, and then, you know, including that, humans being able to, to use these uh, different species in, in productive, unique ways. Uh, speaking of, of productive, unique ways, uh, something that, that I didn't really think about until this was, was brought to my attention. This here is is the uh, Kalahari apple tree. Um, this tree, as you can see, has these large hairy uh, leaves. They use these for toilet paper, right? What are you gonna use if you're out in the desert with you know, so many things having spines and burrs and, and other things like this? Um, so again, the, here, here you have something that uh, the, the indigenous populations had found um, a fairly unique use for. Um, this is a, a tree that is also indicative of, of really fertile soil. So uh, in some places, if you were able to want to try to engage in some sort of agriculture in, in some way, um, looking at a place that maybe has natural um, populations of apple tree living there might be something that, that, is, that is useful. It's really good fodder for some of the, the larger species like eland. Um, and then the bark promotes milk curling. Uh, so again, just the, this, this knowledge that these people had, I just thought was, was absolutely uh, phenomenal. And to think about this being culturally transmitted um, generation after generation and from one group to another group, I think it's just absolutely fascinating. A couple other things, this corkwood down here was this, um, looked like a, a diseased plant. It often looked dead. It had really flaky uh, yellowish colored bark. 
Um, this is a source of myrrh. Uh, you know, it's so a gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and so this is, is something uh, of value. Um, speaking of, of, of some of these things of value, uh, you know, how do people uh, carry out hygiene? You don't have water there to spare on taking a bath or a shower. Um, and, and so what uh, most of the um, indigenous people, peoples of Southern Africa did is they used a, a type of um, almost like an incense type of thing. And I forget what um, plant it was, but I think it was a, a type of sage. And they would collect these leaves from the sage, they'd dry them out, and then they would burn them. And they'd basically take their clothing, their dresses, for example, their skirts, and put them over this tiny little fire that they would make. Um, and then that, that smoke would then create this almost like um, aromatic uh, perfume that would allow them in a sense to take almost a type of dry bath, if you will. Um, so again, you know, we just take these things for granted. And um, one of the people um, that I met there just thought it was hilarious that Americans complain about not having hot water, right? You turn on the water and you have water in your house and it's clean and you can drink it. And here you are complaining that it's not hot enough, right? Uh, and so it just kind of helps put things in perspective that people are going to have different challenges and different solutions um, to, to some of these things, depending on, on their environment. Thank you, going, Steve, any questions? Yeah, back a uh, couple slides back when you talked about the uh, Wawishia. Mm -hmm. Wawishia, yep. Okay, so you said, I think you said it has two leaves. Yes, ah, but you, yes. But you showed us a pile of something. Yes, I apologize for that. So what happens is those leaves will split so what happens here is it, it turns woody here. And as that wood continues to grow, it causes the leaves to split. So they splinter like this in all these different, uh, not different directions, but it's just almost like splitting up a palm frond in a sense that it's still coming from that one, one leaf, or in this case, you know, two leaves. Um, so that's what it looks like. So that, those are just two leaves. Um, and they're not compound leaves or anything like this. It's just a single long leaf. But then has split in these different different ways. Okay. Yeah, I and apologize. So, does this plant have like a really deep tap root, or I mean, like we know we think of succulents and cacti as normally having really shallow roots, mm -hmm. but then some of the things you've talked about have really long roots because yep. they have to get to where the water is. So, what's the story on this one? This one has what I would consider to be a fairly deep root, but its roots are only about four meters deep, maybe four to six meters deep, something like that. So that's pretty deep. But when you compare it to some of these other things like shepherd's tree, that's pretty shallow. Um, and so they have a, a kind of, I'd say a, a mixed system. Their roots uh, are relatively shallow and spread out, but they, but it's not as shallow as, as some of the other things that, you know, might only get down uh, one or two feet. Right. Well, and that's, yeah, but even, yeah, when you said only four meters, we're talking, yeah. you know, 13 feet or something, yeah. which is, you know, deeper than deep. a 200 foot oak tree, you know, in this country. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, let's see. Corkwood. Leadwood, I just put on here because this is another uh, uh, species that's used for different artwork and things like this. It's called leadwood because it sinks in water. So it's a very, a very heavy, uh, dense, dense wood. All right. Okay. So, that's, that's what I wanted to share with you guys about the plant stuff. I wish I had more, but, the, uh, but I wanted to focus on not just the plant stuff, but also some of the birds, some of the mammals, and as you'll see here, a, a couple of the other things as well. Um, and so again, like with the plants, what I, what I really enjoyed about the, the trip to Namibia was looking at things, seeing things, learning about things, and learning about some of the life that has evolved there that just doesn't have counterparts in North America, in the United States. And one of those is this group of hornbills. We saw all six of these species on our, on our trip. Um, these Southern yellow-billed hornbills down here are just absolutely amazing. You see this flash of something big. People call them flying bananas because the first thing that jumps out to you in this you know, gray brown habitat will be this big yellow bill. So these birds are, are pretty good size, um, probably a, a, a foot and a half to two feet um, from head to, to tip of tail. Um, but these guys, uh, in addition to being diverse and, and not present in, in, in the new world, uh, have this really interesting nesting behavior. They are cavity nesters, so they need kind of older trees that have natural cavities in them. 
And then the female goes into these cavities and will lay the eggs and take care of the young. And the male then will basically seal her in that cavity with this mud, a uh, mixture of mud with sometimes a little bit of feces and just leaves her a tiny little slit like this where he will then provide all the food to feed her and the developing nestlings. Uh, when those nestlings are finally ready to fledge and leave the nest, they then bust out, if you will, and then leave. But that entire time of, of incubating the eggs and brooding the young, the brooding the nestlings, uh, they are basically encased in this thing, uh, in this cavity with this kind of a, a mud wall, uh, keeping them relatively safe from predators. There's a, a, another bird in there. Uh, that we didn't look at today that actually has um, people sometimes say, oh, birds have backwards knees. So that's not true. What they have or what you're looking at that you think is the knee is actually its ankle. Um, but there are, but despite that, there are a couple of species in Southern Africa that have backwards knees, knees that are able to bend backwards in a way. And it's to be able to get into some of these, these cavities to get those, those young and, and the brooding females, incubating females that, that are in there. So these, uh, this suite of, of hornbills is one of my my favorite groups to see there. Going to Africa and seeing things like ostriches and quarry bustards, these are both large birds. Um, quarry bustards about a, a meter tall, probably ostriches uh, double that. Uh, but these are absolutely amazing birds. And so these, these, these uh, males look like this, a, a slight bit larger than the, than the um, gray brown females. Um, but they have these communal uh, nests that might have 20, 30, 40 eggs in there. And each egg is is you know about almost the size, not the dimensions, but about the size of a, of a volleyball and incredibly, incredibly thick. You might think that they're relatively breakable at that size, but they are relatively heavy even when, when dried and, and empty. Um, so ostriches and quarry busters were pretty neat. Um, there's a couple of birds there that might kind of surprise you. You know, most people I think associate parrots with the Amazon and the, the neotropics. There's a few species living in, in Namibia, living in Southern Africa, and Rupel's parrot um, is, is one of them. There's an, another one called Meyer's parrot that looks nearly identical to this one, um, but um, different species of parrot. Um, there's another species here, uh, the fork-tailed Gudrongo, I think is, is a pretty neat bird. Um, we, and so what we uh, saw them doing was following common warthogs. And so as these warthogs are going through, and you know, first time you see a warthog, you know, I, I hate to say this as a, as, as, a, as a biologist, but you can't help but think of like Madagascar or something like this, kind of plowing their way through and they're just kind of, you know, just seem almost kind of reckless and they're just going through doing these things. But the fork-tailed drongo will follow these mammals. And as these things are moving through the vegetation, they are scaring up insects. And so as an insect flushes to get out of the way of this tromping little group of warthogs, the fork-tailed drongo flies in and grabs it and eats it. And so this is sometimes called the beater effect. These mammals walk through and beat up, stir up uh, the, these um, insects, and then the, the birds come in after them. It's not too different from say what uh, cattle egrets do here in, in the US, or in even some cases what some um, ant birds and things like this do following groups of army ants in the, in the tropics. Um, the other thing that's pretty neat about the fork-tailed drongo is, is they will uh, form a mixed uh, species flock. So they will join a flock with different species in there. And these flocks kind of have a pecking order where there are some species maybe uh, are, that are a little bit larger or a little bit more dominant. They kind of get the, the lion's share, the good hunting positions, if you will. And, and the fork-tailed drongo is not one of these guys. They are kind of one of the more um, submissive types of species. Uh, and so what they will do is they will elicit false alarm calls to scare the other birds, to get them to flush up into the trees as if there is some predatory threat encroaching. And then when they do, when the other birds flush out, the drongo goes in there and, and gets the caterpillar that another bird had just discovered or something like this. And so there's this neat interplay that you know, over time, these drongos can't fake it all the time. Otherwise, the other species would, would basically stop responding. So there's this sort of evolutionarily stable strategy that you can fake it once in a while, but you can't fake it too much. Uh, so again, just a fascinating uh, natural history story here. There are other species. I'm not, <clears throat> not trying to show you guys just the pretty species or, or the big ones or the, you know, the big vultures or the eagles. We saw lots of different, uh, about three different species of eagle at least three different species of eagle. 
Um, but some of them I just feel like I have to have to share with you guys. These are all species that we saw, Rufus crown rollers, um, lilac breasted rollers, and violet eared waxbill. Again, different species, um, two groups, the rollers and the waxbills, that we just have no comparable species like this in the United States, but they are absolutely striking, beautiful colors, just um, amazing birds. And as, as somebody that studies birds, you, you go through and you try to study and learn about things before you get there. And then you see something, you're like, I know what that is. I've never seen it before, but I know it from the field guide. It uh, makes you feel like you've, you've done a little bit of prep work before, before a trip. Um, and then here's a, a, a scimitar bill. There's uh, two species, again, that look very similar uh, to this one. This is the common uh, scimitar bill, um, but uh, it has a, a bit of a behavior, almost like a, a, a woodpecker. It looks like an overgrown. This thing is over a foot big. It looks a bit like an overgrown sunbird or an overgrown hunt, um, uh, hummingbird, um, not closely related at all. But again, they have these amazing behaviors where they go around and they creep along the trunks of the trees, much like a, a wood creeper or a, or a, a woodpecker would. Um, and then these sociable weavers, um, about as boring of a species as you could imagine, right? These are just a little size of a, of a house sparrow, basically, and not especially handsome looking, if you, if you ask me, but they make these communal colonies here that might have 50 to 100 tiny little nests in there. So this is like a giant apartment block and they're all nesting up in there. And I didn't see any, but sometimes a species of parrot will um, take over one of these things. And so you'll, not, not a parrot, pardon me, a falcon will take over uh, one, of these, one of these colonies. And I didn't see, see that, uh, but it's just amazing that you get all these nests that are just being maintained all the time. So even outside the breeding season, these things maintain and they're bringing in grass stems and things like this, fixing up their nest. And as somebody who has studied some, some different aspects of, of avian diseases, you know, most, most bird nests with uh, the exception of, of, of a few things like eagles and some raptors, most birds build a new nest every year. And those that breed more than once in a typical summer will breed, will use a different nest for each breeding attempt. Uh, and the, the reasons for that are, are, are several, that, but one of the big ones I think is Birds are pretty disgusting creatures in the nest. They defecate in there most of the time. They have all their feathers in there. Um, and so birds have lice and mites and bot flies and all these things. And, you know, seeing something like this, you know, colony of sociable weavers, the first thing I wondered is how are they not just covered with lice and bot flies and these other types of things? And, and I, act, I don't have an answer for that. I, I, I don't know, but, I, but that would be something that I think would be interesting to either research um, directly or maybe somebody already has an answer to that. I, I don't know. Um, but that, that is, a, is a sociable weaver. All right. Uh, and so here you guys might be thinking, what is that cute thing here? Well, this is a kelp gull. And if you were thinking, no, I was thinking about the other thing, shame on you, birds come first. Uh, but the, uh, the mammal here, moving into the mammals, is a, um, is, a, is a pup of a Cape fur seal. Uh, Namibia has a population of about 350 to 450,000. Um, they are um, still harvested to some degree for their pelts, but they have these enormous populations. They don't give a care about people. They sit there and you can walk right up to them and they will plop down on the boardwalk and make you walk around. Um, but they are these, these young pups. I, I try not to anthropomorphize too much, but they are absolutely adorable, these cute little things with the kind of sad looking eyes and they kind of bleed out calling for their mom to be nursed. Um, uh, and then uh, I, I didn't include um, many of the species that were associated with the few wetlands we had, but there are ephemeral rivers that go through, there are, are wetlands, there are coasts and things like this, um, but there are, there are you know populations of a lot of species of duck and um, uh, seabirds and uh, shorebirds and things like this. And, and two of the favorite ones that I saw are these um, two species of flamingo. Um, most of these are greater flamingo, but there are some lessers in here. And, and in, in going through and, and just birding here, uh, what I realized is lesser flamingos are a lot more skittish. And so you walk up to this group, the lessers will all fly off first. And so once one starts to fly off, the other ones of the same species will all follow it. Um, and then as you get closer still, finally the graders will eventually flush and sometimes they'll just sit there. So I just thought, again, it was kind of neat some of the differences uh, between these uh, two species. All right, um, so now what I'll do is turn for the rest of the time for the next uh, five or 10 minutes to, uh, to some uh, leopards and uh, some of the mammals, I should say. Uh, and you, know, you, you look at some of these cats and 
uh, going there, I could, could identify a, a leopard from a lion, from a, from a cheetah, um, but I didn't understand some of, some of the differences. And so there's, there's big behavioral differences between some of these cheetahs, uh, for example, prefer open habitats. They hunt down, they run down their prey. Uh, they eat only fresh kills. They have to hunt every day. They're easily pushed off of those kills. And in contrast to leopards, like this guy up here at the top, leopards are more of a stalk and a pounce type of thing. So leopards, whereas the cheetahs like those open habitats where they can really run and chase things down, leopards prefer, prefer, uh, prefer more of the scrub and shrub types of habitats where they can lie and wait for something, stalk up and get close, and then get within say 20 meters before they run and, and, and subdue their prey. Uh, we are fortunate enough to work with a group there called AfriCat, where we were able to get out and, and see some lions up, up close. Uh, we were able, and so this is me with my crappy little cell phone, trying to take a picture through binoculars. This is what this looks like. My students were able to get much better pictures than I was, things like this, I think actually came from a nice SLR camera. Um, but my camera, my photos came out looking <laughs> looking like this. But still, to see lions and leopards in the wild is a pretty powerful experience. It, it, it really is fascinating. And the leopard that we were able to see was radio collared. It's a wild leopard, but it was radio collared for research purposes. And we could see across the dirt road where it had dragged the, the warthog across the road. And we got to within maybe 15 meters of it. And you could sit there and just watch it through your binoculars and watch this leopard just enjoy its prey. I hate to say it, but not too different from a, an overgrown house cat. It was just absolutely a, amazing watching this thing. And then you'd all of a sudden start to hear it. Ooh, it's crunching through bone or cartilage or something like this. And so quite different from, uh, from, a, from a house cat. Um, then we learned that some of these markings on, on the tails and the backs of the ears of lions are thought to uh, contribute to what's known as pilot tracing so that the young can follow their, their females through the through the, uh, through the habitat, even in low light conditions. And so you see uh, some of these things that um, at least I was, was not aware of. Oh, and cheetahs also are semi-social, whereas leopards are more or less completely solitary, except for uh, when they're with their young uh, or mating. Um, so anyhow, lots of differences between, between these things, some, some more subtle than others. Um, zebras, uh, some of the things I like to do is really try to learn how to identify different species of these things. And, and so here we have two species of zebra, Hartman's Mountain Zebra and the Plains Zebra. Um, learned about kinships, a group of zebras is called a kinship, uh, which consists of, of uh, related females and then an unrelated stallion that goes in and, and basically um, uh, has access uh, as a, uh, to a harem there. Um, but the Plains uh, Zebra here, um, is, is different compared to the, the mountain zebra. Um, it has these shadow stripes. Um, so you can see right here in the zebra, it has its main stripes, but then on the white, it has these tiny little faint stripes in here that you can, here that you can see. Um, these stripes um, seem to be um, involved in basically reducing the number of flies and parasitic um, insects that can land on, on the zebra. So I thought that was pretty, pretty interesting. Doesn't seem to have much to do with camouflage. Um, and these stripes on the plain zebra extend all the way down onto the belly, whereas over here you can see that they, they do not. They have relatively little or no striping on the legs compared to the mountain zebra. They have a black versus a brown snout. They have larger hoofs. So again, you know, at first you just go there the first time you're like, ooh, a zebra. And then you start to say, hey, this is different from this one and, and start to figure some of these things out. It's, it's pretty interesting. Anytime you can see primates in, in the wild, I think is a pretty phenomenal opportunity. These um, uh, chakma bab baboons were just everywhere. I was really surprised at, at how much of a generalist they were. They were in the cyclone Peru, they were in the central plateau, they were in the mountains. They seemed to be, be pretty common and they would come you know, through the, the camp at, at, at night uh, up in the trees when, when we were asleep and were uh, pretty, pretty noisy at, at some times. Um, the oryx, as I mentioned before, uh, first of all, was larger than I had had, had in, envisioned. Um, and I was really impressed with the ability of, of this species just to survive in, in parts of the Namib desert in places where you just, you know, how are they able to ever find water? How are they able to survive? Um, how are they ever able to find a mate and rear young? It, it just really was amazing that these uh, species have evolved to, to be able to do that. Um, giraffes, I thought were interesting. Um, for the first, uh, first time I saw the giraffe, um, our tour guide, John, had just said, hey, you know, I, I asked him, what sorts of animals might you see here? Because it reminded me of parts of Arizona 
And he said, you know, warthogs and some other things, oryx and giraffe was in there. I'm like, giraffe, really? Because the habitat wasn't very tall. It wasn't uh, green or it, it. And so I look around, you know, there's no way there can be a giraffe here. And I look in a different direction all of a sudden and I, and I blurt out giraffe and I yell it out loud. I was so excited, like a nine-year-old catching his first fish. I got one. And, and I yelled giraffe and I start walking over to it. And I'm holding my binocs, not looking where I'm going. And I trip over a, a little root there at the edge of the dirt parking lot, bite it. Binocs were fine, no worries. And, um, and then I couldn't see the giraffe. Where is the giraffe? We are not in thick, dense jungle or plateau habitat. It is pretty open. And this giraffe that is four meters tall, all of a sudden is gone. And so it made me start thinking, oh, John had just said we might see giraffes. Did I trick myself? Well, no, it was there. And then in, in, it was just hidden behind some trees. And you wouldn't think that these things could be so camouflaged in such an open habitat, but they, but they are. Um, and, and, and then after that, we saw three others that eventually were a little bit further away that took us longer to, to, to see it. Um, and the other thing about giraffes is these animals, as they come into some of these water holes, especially around Natasha, where we were able to have lighted water holes so we could see them at night, water holes pulling animals from all over the place, both predator and prey. Um, but they have really different behaviors. Something like a giraffe takes forever to get there. So they will sit there 50 meters away from the water hole for an hour to two hours before they actually go into the water, to the edge of the water and drink. Other things, including some of the predators, will just go in there uh, like spotted hyenas and, and drink and leave. But um, some other ones like orcs will go in there and drink and leave. Other ones will drink but hang out. Jackals will go in there and they will hang out. Other species will go in there slowly and, and hang out. So it's just really interesting how, how some of these species did um, very different things. A um, couple species of rhino that we saw, again, a, a night shot that was the best that you could see. I was trying to take this through my camera, uh, through my binox as well. Um, but uh, the black and white rhino, you can distinguish fairly easily with a little practice based on size and solitary, the shape of the mouse, mouth, I should say. Are they grazers and eating grass off the ground? Or are they browsers eating branches and twigs and, and trees and things like this? And looking at the, the size of the head and the positioning of the ears, um, where the calves are, are they following in front? Or are they following or are they in front of the female? And, and so just some of these things were absolutely phenomenal. And right here, again, you can see these, these are um, square-lipped or white rhinos that are probably only about 50 yards away from us in a relatively open habitat. But here you have something that is bigger than an SUV, about the size of two SUVs, and they kind of blend in a little bit. If you're not paying attention to them, that's something that if you were driving by, you could easily, easily pass. Um, some of the, the uh, predators there, spotted hyenas, were absolutely phenomenal. I saw one on my, my first full day in Namibia. I was doing, the students were taking a little bit of a rest. They were tired. I was like, there are birds to be seen. So I went hiking up this valley and, and saw a spotted hyena and figured, well, there's no point in turning around now. If, if it wants to get me, it's going to get me. Um, so I wrote it down in my book. So if something happened to me, people would know. <laughs> um, but, uh, but they were uh, pretty fascinating animals. The black backed jackals were just, they're a tiny little thing. They're probably only about 15 um, to 20 pounds. They were a pretty small um, canine that uh, was, was pretty, pretty fun. Um, the highlight of the trip for me, more than the lions, more than the leopards, was the African elephants. Um, first one we saw of this was hiking up a, a desert wash in uh, the evening, and we were up literally staying in a massive tree house up above the wash and this big tree at the edge of the wash, and this, this elephant walks right up to us and just kind of looks at us out of this, you know, its eyes are over here on the side of its head. It doesn't turn its head to look at us, but it just looks at us. We were so close with the naked eye, you could see its eyelashes, and it just looked at us, and it seemed like it was just like, nothing of interest here and it just continued on. But we learned how to track elephants. Um, I don't wanna go into too much detail right now, but if you have questions for the end, I'd love to share some of that with you. But basically you can tell the sex of an elephant, you can track it through, through time and space uh, because they take a rest during the day. There's a lot of ways to do this. Expert trackers can actually identify elephants by their footprints, uh, just like a, you know, a detective might be able to identify a fingerprint Trackers there in Namibia can do the same with elephants. We saw almost every type of antelope and gazelle that you can imagine there, um, from these massive elands to kudus to springboks. 
to these little dick dicks that are that are maybe a foot and a half tall, just dinky little things. Um, and I ate all of these there, um, except for this one. Uh, so um, game meat is, is pretty popular there, uh, as, you, as you might imagine. Uh, and then, you know, the mammals, I don't wanna leave out the humans. You know, I was there with these students down here, uh, over here that were just learning so much and you get close to them as you wake up and have breakfast with them and dinner with them. And um, they had a, a phenomenal trip. Um, our, our guide, John, some of the, the local indigenous people that were guides for us. This is a guy who was one of the expert elephant trackers that just knew, seemed like everything you could imagine uh, to know about elephants. Um, we then went to, um, to, to visit um, uh, this one uh, indigenous group called the Himba or the Ova Himba. Um, this is a, a phenomenal place. These people are nomadic to this day. Um, they have a, a king. This was their king right here standing up. He looked like a pretty young guy, but he, they said he was 50, but it must have been either a translational error uh, or uh, a mythical status type of thing. And I didn't feel comfortable asking, but he was a, a young guy, maybe in his upper 20s or early 30s. They're a polygynous society, so he had four wives. Every woman there that is of uh, uh, reproducing age had at least two kids, um, one, you know, zero to a year and a half and one about three. Um, and it was just absolutely amazing to see how these people um, earn a living. Um, these people historically were the same as the Herrero people, um, but as German colonists arrived, um, some adapted some of the German traditions. They are now the Herrero people and the people who remained and continued the traditional indigenous um, traditions are the Ovahimba. So genetically they are, they are identical. It was just this almost, I don't wanna say random splitting, but some decided to adopt some of the German traditions, including um, uh, dress here from, from 18th and 19th century um, German um, colonials. Uh, we went and uh, saw a few herps. Um, and one of the things that you learn is just, you know, they call five fingers of dangerous snakes. And so, uh, and so you go through your five fingers of a thumb. If it's a thick bodied snake, it's dangerous. If it's a spitting snake, like with your trigger finger, it could be dangerous. If it's long, like your middle finger, like the black mamba, that can be dangerous. Your ring finger, ring snakes are dangerous. And then pinky fingers, your little finger, young snakes haven't yet learned uh, to control the, the amount of venom that they inject. So be, getting bitten by a young snake is often more dangerous than, than getting bitten by uh, an, uh, uh, an adult snake. Um, there are chameleons there, and these chameleons uh, will eat these uh, Tenebriana uh, beetles. These beetles are absolutely amazing. I forgot to tell you that the Welwitia do this too, but both the Welwitia and these beetles uh, engage in what's called fog harvesting or strip harvesting. These cold fogs come in uh, almost every morning into parts of the, the desert here. And this beetle will stand up with his butt up in the air. And as that cold fog comes in, it condenses on the back of the beetle. The, the uh, droplets then condense and run down the back, right down into the mouth of the beetle. Uh, so it's absolutely just phenomenal. And that's how they get access to water. This beetle can also roll itself up basically into a little wheel and roll downhill down these massive dunes when they um, are, are being uh, attacked or uh, preyed upon by a, a chameleon. Um, termite mounds were all over the place. Here was about the biggest one we saw, but these things get up to over four meters tall. Um, They're really cool. They all lean into the sun due to differential heating and contraction of those things. And I know I'm, I'm running a little bit out of time, petroglyphs, some of the, 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 the stories that you had with people and, and being able to look and see, you know, what animal is this? What animal is that? And you can see that. And these things are two to 6,000 years old. It's just amazing. Um, and they also had other ones where they would lay out a map of the area and they would have rings that indicated ephemeral sources of water. And if those rings had a dot in the middle, that indicated a permanent source of water. And so these were not just artistic expressions, but they were ways to convey information as these people, um, these nomads moved around from place to place where they could go and, and use that to, to find water. And I, I have only, I think, two, two slides left. So I appreciate you uh, sticking around a little bit past eight. Um, but both before and after the trip, it was actually cheaper for me to fly into Cape Town and then do a separate trip to Namibia. 
than flying directly. So I spent a little bit of time in Cape Town, gave a talk at University of Cape Town and at another university nearby. Um, went to Table Mountain National Park, which is this massive flat plateau right in, right outside, I should say, of Cape Town. It basically is between Cape Town and the coast. Um, absolutely amazing. This is where Kirsten Bosch is. Went to Robin Island, which is um, where um, Nelson Mandela was in prison for most of his life. Um, those tours are still guided by former prisoners, and that's not going to continue very much longer. The guy that led our tour, I would guess, was probably about 80, 85 years old. Um, and then I, I went down to, to Cape of Good Hope, and going down there, I, I saw these African penguins. So they're, these are the same penguins that we have have in the uh, Memphis Zoo. Um, and so it's pretty interesting. You think penguins is living in these cold, icy conditions and, and well, they survive in the tropics in both the Galapagos Islands and here in the Southern part of Africa. And what these two places have in common is that you have this really cold water coming up from the South, from Antarctica. Um, and, and here's one of the pictures I took of, of Cape of Good Hope. I don't know what plant this is, um, but it was absolutely um, everywhere. And I thought it was quite, quite pretty. Um, but Kirsten Bosch, if you ever get a chance to go to, to Kirsten Bosch, it's a, it is worth the trip. It's this amazing place. You think about these different floral kingdoms across the, the planet, there's about six, depending on how you divvy them up. The smallest is the Cape Floral Kingdom. It's just in this very Southern part of, of Africa. One of the most um, uh, famous areas there is the Fanebosch. Um, and, and they have just this, this is, this is uh, part of uh, Kirsten Bosch right here. Um, but the Feinbosch has these, these proteas, this, this silver tree. So this is a picture I took from up on, on Table Mountain National Park, looking down into Cape Town. So you have this national park, it's right there. I walked to the national park from my Airbnb. It was, it was incredible. And to get there, I walked through the university. So it was a little bit of a walk, but hey, it was, it was worth it. And so they had these proteas, um, three main um, groups of proteas, like this silver tree here, the restios, which are superficially look like grasses. And then some of these um, uh, heath or heathers um, really are kind of diagnostic of, of the Feinbosch. Um, and then not surprisingly, this, these unique habitats like the Feinbosch have, have unique birds too. So these are two endemic birds that are found nowhere else in the world. Cape sugarbird is, is basically a, an overgrown, a mockingbird with a, an overgrown tail. And then this orange-breasted um, sugarbird is, um, is another endemic that um, is, is another species that we just don't get anything like um, in, in North America. Um, but that is, is what I had for, for today. Again, here, here you see it, one of the acacias, just kind of this iconic shot of, of, uh, of African landscape and some of the vegetation. You can see a little bit of the sociable weaver nest in here. Um, but anyhow, thank you for the opportunity to share this with you, with you. If you guys have any questions, please holler. And I'm trying to get a class together for not just students, but for continuing education to try to get a group of, of uh, normal people who are well past college who might be interested in doing a two to three week trip to Namibia. So if you ever have interest in that, shoot me an email and, uh, and I'll be happy to fill you in on sort of what I'm thinking and if that ever gets off the ground, but I'm, I'm optimistic that we can do that in the next year or two. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. If you guys have any questions, please holler. Thank you guys. Yeah, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, I know that he rolled through a lot of information there. <laughs> Um, and I, I like the last part because I was sitting here thinking, you know, how do we sign up to become students? But, you know, if you have one that's open to to adults, that sounds pretty cool. Um, the other thing I just want to point out to everybody is when we talk about deserts, um, keep in mind that, you know, when you heard that this was talk was going to be talking about desert environments. But look how much life there is. Look how many things are surviving very well. Um, the fog, you know, the, the, they may not get rainfall, but there's moisture. It's just pretty amazing, really. Uh, so, and um, there's a lot to, you know, certainly we have huge deserts in this country that if you've not ever explored them, they're well worth exploring. And you can see petroglyphs in this country and all kinds of great things. So, uh, and you can, and you can certainly study how wildlife um, survives. So I've, Phil, just a moment, and mostly it looks like the chat messages are all thank you and um, great talk. Appreciate the information, uh, very fascinating information. And I'm sure that we will have some questions that come up after we're done here, because again, you did cover a lot of ground 
And I don't mean to make a pun in saying that, but you didn't cover a lot of ground. So if something if, if it, something comes up to someone's mind later on, you know, shoot me an email. I can always forward it to Michael and get, get some clarification from you. So um, with that, I will, um, I'll go ahead and stop recording now.